Merci beaucoup. Je suis très heureuse et très honorée d'être ici aujourd'hui, mais je veux parler en anglais. J'espère que c'est où le... Ok, alors... Ah, c'est ici. Ok, ça va. Ah, c'est bien. Ah, ok, ok. Merci. So, um, maybe you take a minute to relax and to sit down, <laughs> to lay back and imagine that you're somewhere on the top of a mountain, maybe the Mont Blanc, and that you look at the sky. And if you're lucky, if you have a very clear night, you will see thousands and thousands of glimmering light sources and perhaps even the extended nebulous band of the Milky Way. So this is our home galaxy, and it is actually made of 100 billion of stars. Of course, we are inside the Milky Way. We cannot take pictures from the outside, but if we could, it would look very much like our close neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy. This is only two million light years away. One light year is 9.5 trillion kilometers. Um, it's a measure of distance. And, um, well, it looks like a beautiful spiral galaxy also with about 100 billions of stars. And today, we can take many pictures, not only of the Milky Way and of Andromeda, but of our entire visible universe in different wavelengths. So not only in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, but all the way from very high energy gamma rays to the very long radio waves. And we can produce such beautiful pictures of the universe, and we can learn a lot about its composition, its evolution, and so on. However, as I will also show you, we have an increasingly number of observations that tell us that actually most of the matter that we observe, as we shall see indirectly, is invisible or dark. Okay? That means it does not interact via electromagnetic radiation. And if you think about this, maybe it's not that surprising, at least it's not very surprising to me, because our most basic assumption is that everything we would see in the universe would shine in some way or absorb radiation. But why should this be the case? Right? As you know, we have also learned that the Earth is not at the center of the solar system. Uh, our sun is only one in these 100 billions of galaxies, uh, sorry, 100, 100 billions of stars in the Milky Way, and we are at the outskirts of it. And our own Milky Way is only one in two trillions of galaxies in the observable universe. So why would we assume that all the matter that, we see, that, that exists is, can be directly observed? Okay? So the story started, as it has been said already today, in 1933, with a Swiss-American astronomer, Fritz Zwicky, he was then researching at Caltech in the US, and he could measure the velocities of individual galaxies in a very rich cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster. And what he discovered is that these velocities were way too high. This cluster would not be a bound object, but a galaxy would simply fly apart. So he concluded there must be a lot more, about 10 times more matter that was directly seen, that is directly in the galaxies, and actually later on, even in the hot intracluster gas. So Fritz Zwicky was a brilliant physicist, brilliant astronomer on the one hand side. On the other hand, he was also true to his nature as a mountaineer. He was from Switzerland, from the canton of Glarus, and was often inclined to provocation. For instance, he called, he called all of his colleagues spherical bastards, bastards from every way you looked at them. So anyway, he, did, he had a lot of contributions to physics, also supernovas and many others, but maybe these are some of the reasons why his discovery went largely unnoticed until many decades later when Vera Rubin and her team measured the rotational speed of stars and gas in spiral galaxies. And she came to the same astonishing conclusions, the stars and the gas were moving, this is just the velocity as a function of the distance from the center of a galaxy. These were moving way too fast and not as expected based on the visible matter alone. 
That means that even our own star would fly, would fly out into space if there wouldn't be much more matter. So she came to the same conclusion. These galaxies must be filled with dark matter. That, and this matter, via its gravitational force, would keep all of the stars and the gas together. Okay? So this was in the 70s. And today, many decades later, we also have actually a standard model of cosmology not only a standard model of particle physics, as you heard, and we can do so-called precision cosmology. For instance, this is here a picture that was taken by the ESA Planck satellite of the temperature variation of the cosmic microwave background in the sky. So this is the echo of the Big Bang. This is the radiation that we see from the moment about three to 400 years after the Big Bang when the universe became transparent. And this radiation is actually extremely uniform. So the non-uniformities that you can see here are one in 10 to the five, okay? But these non-uniformities can tell us how much matter, how much dark matter, and so on there was in this early universe. And actually, this standard model of cosmology fits the data exceedingly well. There's no other theory that can explain all the observations on many cosmological scales. However, there's a, a, a small problem with this model, is namely that about 5% now of the total matter and energy in the universe is made of atoms, or, or in astronomers also call these baryons, of matter that we know and that you have heard about in the standard model. So about 27% is dark matter, and then 68% is dark energy, which might be you know, a cosmological constant, the energy of the vacuum. So here I will talk about 27%, Earlier, I said 85%. So this 85 was referring to the matter density alone, while the 27% refers to the matter and energy density in the universe. So today, we know, we know that this dark matter is necessary to even form the structures that we see, to form the large-scale structures, to form galaxy. We can map its precise, um, its precise distribution in the universe via the so-called gravitational lensing effect, okay? And, and, and but, but maybe you realize already that all the evidence we have is indirect, right? We are its gravitational pull on luminous matter. So that dark matter influences the way the luminous matter clusters and moves, but we see it indirectly. And even more than 80 years after the first discovery by Fritz Zwicky, we still do not know what is made of, as my colleagues already um, mentioned today. So first, just one slide again on the standard model. I know now you know already all the particles. These are just a different way uh, to picture them here. Just let's remind ourselves what normal matter is made of. So it's just made of neutrons, protons, electrons, and here, and actually everything that we observe, galaxies, star, planets, people, and so on. So everything, all of this normal matter can absorb or emit electromagnetic radiation. And none of these particles here in the standard model is a good candidate, as we have also heard, for the dark matter. Early in the 80s, it was thought that perhaps neutrinos could be the dark matter, right? Because neutrinos are the only particles here, it has also been said already, that do not interact with light, do not interact electromagnetically. However, today we know that it's not possible. They, they're way too light and they wouldn't form the structures that we see. So, on the other hand, you have also seen that all the known particles were produced in a very, very early, very energetic phase of our universe, okay? And, and back then, the universe was young and energetic, and you know many other particles could have been produced at the same time. Among these, also supersymmetric particles, for example, or other particles, and, and some, of the, some of which might be stable and might have survived until today. And if these particles really exist, and these particles then also must have an extremely, a very weakly coupling to normal matter, as we also have seen, okay? Like, the Higgs boson has a weak coupling, and these new particles may have a similar or even weaker coupling. So if they have such a weak coupling, and also if they are stable, they could survive, and they could actually form all the structures that we see, including, including the halo of our own Milky Way. So this is actually an artist's uh, picture here. We have the spiral structure 
of the Milky Way of our galaxy, and then we have this dark halo that is much more extended. We don't actually really know where it ends. These are, this is a picture from, from a computer from so-called n-body simulations of structure of galaxy formation. And because of its gravitational uh, pull, this dark matter can also form substructure. Now, you will ask me, well, if these particles do not couple or, or only very, very weakly to the standard model particles, how can we possibly make them visible? How can we discover them? So apart from these constraints that we get from astrophysics, we have more or less three ways, and one was already mentioned here. So we can produce these new particles in proton-proton collisions at the LHC with a center of mass energy of a few TV. This is this blob is here. This is just um, uh, you know a parameterization of the unknown. We do not know yet which fundamental interactions take place here. Of course, in reality, it is a bit more complicated. This is just one example here from supersymmetry. But what happens? This is a picture actually of the Atlas experiment. Uh, what happens is that these particles are produced together with other particles, and because they interact so weakly they will simply fly out of the detector, just like neutrinos, they will not interact. However, you can still infer their presence by looking at the total energy or the total momentum that was deposited in your detectors and looking at some missing momentum, okay? And this missing momentum or missing energy has to be attributed to these new particles. Now, another, another uh, possibility to look for these is to look for the annihilation products of these particles, for instance, in the halo of our galaxy, in the galactic center, or in the sun. The rate will go, the rate will go as the density squared, so this is why we have to look in regions where the density of these particles might be enhanced. And why, why? so they must have a non-zero annihilation cross-section because also in the early universe they were produced, as I mentioned, together with these other particles, but not all of them annihilated, some were left over, okay? So there are different ways to look for this. So basically you have annihilation into standard model particles, you have some cascades, some decays, and then you start looking for new particles which are above some astrophysical background. And to have the slightest chance of a discovery, you have to look for, for example, um, for antiprotons or positrons, this is the AMS experiment on the International Space Station. So for antiprotons or positrons, which are above the astrophysical background, okay? You can also look for high energy neutrinos coming from the center of the sun. Our sun has been around for a long time, four and a half billion years, and you know, meanwhile there is some equilibrium between the capture and the annihilation of these particles in the center of the sun. So while all the other particles that are being produced will be stopped in the sun because they have much higher interaction cross-sections, the neutrinos can escape, just like the neutrinos from the center of our sun can escape. However, these neutrinos, their energy, their energy will be related to the mass of these dark matter particles. So you are looking, for example, with the Antares experiment here in France that is off the coast of Toulon, I'm sure you all heard of it, or with another experiment that is at the South Pole, it's called the Ice Cube Experiment, that has instrumented one kilometer cube of ice. Here the water is instrumented with very long strings of photodetectors. So with this type of uh, experiments, you look for high energy neutrinos above the, um, above the neutrino energy spectrum that is coming from the sun, okay? And these neutrinos will then, will then interact, for example, with the water, will produce charged particles, and these particles can then be detected via their Cherenkov light that's produced. Yet another, another way to look for, um, another way to look for uh, dark matter annihilation again, in the galactic center, in the galactic halo, or even from other galaxies, such as so-called dwarf spheroidals, these are small galaxies that are totally dominated by dark matter. Another way is to look for high-energy photons, high-energy gamma rays, okay? You can look for a continuum, or, which would be very nice to see, would be a line signature, just like, in, just as in the case of the Higgs boson. However, the probability for such a line signature is very small, 
because this particle cannot directly annihilate into gammas, right? They, they don't have any direct coupling to, to photons. So the revolution in this field to look for gamma rays from dark band annihilation was the Fermi LAT instrument on the Fermi satellite. I will show you a few results. And uh, this is a space-based experiment, but there are also ground-based so-called Cherenkov air telescopes. And these, these look for, uh, for this Cherenkov light that is being produced by showers of particles in the Earth's atmosphere. Okay? We have the HES detectors and other, and the future here is the Cherenkov telescope array. Okay? So all of these experiments constrain the annihilation cross-section. The cross-section is a measure for the strength of the interaction, for the strength of the annihilation of these particles into known particles, into standard model particles. Okay? And so far, well, so far, mostly no dark matter particle has been found in this way. So what, what I'm showing here is mostly limits, constraints, as you have also seen now many constraints from the LHC, meaning that the region above these curves is excluded. So this is here the annihilation cross-section as a function of the mass of the dark matter particle. So this is 10 times, 100, 1,000 times, and so on, the mass of a proton. And you know, if the annihilation cross-section or the mass would be somewhere here, this particle would have already been detected. However, there is one excess that is being observed of gamma rays coming from the galactic center by this Fermi satellite, and this excess is here. This is, this is uh, the theoretical prediction here for the annihilation cross-section for the dark matter to give, the dark matter particle to give the measured abundance in, in, in the universe, okay? And there is an excess there, however, it is not clear or it is more likely actually that it comes from known particles from so-called astrophysical objects like pulsar that are a source, for instance, also of antiparticles such as positrons, okay? And in fact, this region is now also sort of excluded by other data from the same experiment from this Fermi LAT instrument. And the future, the future CTA here will constrain, will constrain here these theoretical predictions at higher dark matter particle masses. So another, another method that I personally am working on is to directly detect these particles. So these are the dark matter particles that make up the halo of our galaxy by their collision with atomic nuclei in detectors with ultra low backgrounds. Okay? So, um, there are more than, uh, probably more than 20 experiments taking data worldwide, and this is an example for one of the crystals of the Edelweiss experiment. This is a French experiment in the Modan underground laboratory. I will come to underground labs in a second, and this is here the photo sensor array of a, an experiment that we have recently built that has about three and a half tons of liquid xenon to look for these very rare interactions with very, very low energies. Now, um, of course, if you build such an experiment, you would like to know what is the expected interaction rate, and first of all, what is the expected flux of these particles on Earth, okay? And you can estimate this, this is here just a very simple formula, but we know from the measured rotation curve of our galaxy what is the local density of the dark matter, and then we know more or less its velocity distribution, so now, depending on the mass of the particle, we can e immediately estimate its flux. And if I take now here a mass that is about 100 times the mass of a proton, so 100 GeV, and if I take the mean local density, which we quote in terms of GeV per cubic centimeter, this is 0 0.3 GeV per cubic centimeter, I get a flux of about 10 to the 5 per square centimeters and second, or about 10 millions through your hand every second. Okay, so you have to imagine this, but you have also heard, I think now you know that this is actually a very small number. You have heard that solar neutrinos, so the neutrinos that are created in the first fusion reaction in our sun, this flux is 65 billions per square centimeters per second. Nonetheless, there is a non-zero chance that we might be able to detect such a particle and actually to have a chance that is non-zero, we have to go deep underground. Why deep underground? Because the cosmic rays would, uh, would cause millions and, and tens of millions of um, you know, more, higher times interactions than the ones that we are looking for. 
So there are many there are many underground laboratories in the world. There is one in France, there is one in Italy. I work here in the Grand Sasso laboratory, so we use mountains as a shield. Inside of these mountains, we have large caverns, and here are mostly experiments to, um, uh, for neutrino physics, for instance, to measure the mass of the neutrinos. We have heard of the neutrino as double beta decay to measure solar neutrinos. And then also there was an experiment who looked for neutrino, neutrino beam that came from CERN to Grand Sasso. And finally, there are also a few dark matter experiments. And Rather recently, we have built there, we have installed a xenon one ton experiment. It is located here in Hall B, which was close to Icarus, which is now at CERN. And you can see here this small picture. So our building here is 10 meters high, uh, and uh, the water shield around the experiment is also 10 meters high, 10 meters in diameter. We have here all the cryogenics, the data acquisition system, the storage. So what we do here, we operate uh, um, about three and a half tons of liquid xenon at minus 100 Celsius, and when a particle interacts in the xenon, it produces, as we produce um, a scintillation light in the vacuum ultraviolet region around 175 uh, nanometers, but also very few free electrons. And we apply very high drift fields, up to one kilovolt per centimeter, in order to drift and then to extract and measure these electrons, meaning that we can actually see single electrons. Okay. Now, you cannot really see the detector is inside. We have a double walled cryostat, of course, to, to cool the xenon, to keep it cold. We have a, a five meter high column to purify oh, for krypton and so on. But this is, this is the inner part which we call time projection chamber that allows us to measure these interactions, the position, the energy, and all of that very precisely. Uh, I'm only showing these pictures. So in Zurich, we built this inner part of the detector. We were also responsible for the photosensors. And here we were making, I was with two students and a former postdoc of mine. We were trying to make sense of these cables and so on. It was just these pictures that made it into Le Monde, uh, Le Science en Image, into, at the end of 2015, even though we had much nicer pictures, of course. But OK. Um, so uh, the good news, we started to take data in November of 2016. It took us one year to characterize the detector, to commission it. Um, we had an earthquake uh, in January. However, we continued after a few days uh, with our science run, and we, are analy we analyzed now here this science run zero. The results will be shown in a few weeks from now. And uh, here I would just like to say that this is the experimentally accessible region by these phonon type detectors such as, such as Edelweiss and others in the, in the US, we have super CDMS, because these are very low energy thresholds, so they can look for light dark matter particles, while with noble liquids, we have liquid xenon, but also liquid argon, we can build very large detectors with ultra low backgrounds and look for much lower cross sections. Interestingly, I, would I didn't say anything about our backgrounds, we have many backgrounds, but uh, you know, a long time ago, 20 years ago, when I started in this field, I couldn't imagine that one day neutrinos will be our background. And we are, you know, we are getting there. So, um, and this is now a bit of history. Again, I started to work in this field around this time. Uh, and this is the evolution of the cross-section that we can probe. So these are very, very small cross-sections, and this is a um, logarithmic scale as a function of the year. We are somewhere here now. We also expect results in the next weeks or so or months from a large liquid argon experiment in Canada at Snow Lab. Then we have xenon one ton. We are working on the upgrade and ton in the US. There's, of course, competition. They are working on the LZ project. And finally, we are also planning a much larger detector, which is called Darwin, a 50-ton liquid xenon detector. So hopefully by 2026, uh, you know, we will not only set better constraints, but we would, of course, like to uh, discover this new particle. And I, I talked a bit about direct detection, indirect detection, and the LHC. This is showing some complementarity here. You have seen the LHC uh, can probe very low cross sections and actually also low masses, while indirect detection is more uh, sensitive to high particle masses. Direct detection, we have sensitivity to higher masses. However, we are limited in the cross section. So. Um, Apart from dark matter searches, I'd like to say there are many other searches, and apart from the LHC, of course, uh, for, for new physics. And here I would like to show very briefly two examples for high precision tests of the standard models 
uh, by not using you know, LHC. And this can give us also a window for beyond standard model because it allows us to probe, uh, to probe very, very high energies. And one of them is to measure the neutron electric dipole moment. Basically, this is a measure of the charge distribution inside the neutron. We know that the neutron is made up of quarks. And if you see, if you see um, a, a dipole moment, it is above the standard model prediction, which is around here, around 10 to the minus 31, then this could shed light on this matter-antimatter symmetry that we have heard of in the universe via CP violation. Okay. This is an example here. This is a new, the neutron EDM experiment at PSI, but there's also one in France, Germany, Japan, and so on. And all of these can improve. They can test actually predictions from supersymmetry that are in the range 10 to the minus 25, 10 to the minus 28 here. And finally, finally there is also uh, measurements of the muon magnetic moment. Actually, 15 years ago, there was an experiment at the Brookhaven National Lab that saw some deviation from st the standard model, you know, and, and this, is, this is, so this G factor, we have the predictions here in first order, two plus minus, uh, plus some corrections from QED and so on, but there could also be, there could also be uh, contributions from beyond standard model physics, for instance, from supersymmetry, and what they see, what they have seen, a value somewhat higher than predicted by the standard model, okay? And now this is an experiment that's very exciting at Fermilab that is just starting, and they will have a factor of four improvement in statistical uncertainty by, uh, in a few years from now. So it is red, I will stop. I think we have seen that we had tremendous progress in particle, but also in astroparticle physics over the last decades. And also hopefully there will be equal amount of progress in the next decades. And the good news is, uh, this applies of course not only to my talk, but to other ones. You have seen we are not out of questions. Whenever we answer one question, there are 10 more questions opening up, so we will still be quite busy for a while. We just have to keep asking. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Edouard Brezin and Catherine Cesarski will vous poser des questions. Ils sont là-bas. I'm here. Oh. Um, okay. Congratulations for your experiment. I wish you good luck with the grants and so on. Uh, one question of curiosity independently of your experiment yes. is it absolutely clear that there is no dark matter outside of the halos that you have shown for instance oh. could they influence gravitational lensing could you conclude oh. conclude that there is no dark matter somewhere well not really i mean there is this web structure that is predicted from structure formation from simulations of structure formation, and now there are actually also measurements that show that you have these filaments. Actually, you know, I mean, the, the galaxies are embedded in galaxy clusters, and there's definitely dark matter in the clusters, but there, is, there are also connections between them. But yes, I didn't really mention this here. Gravitational lensing is another way, uh, not only to look, you know, the weak gravitational lensing effect to, to um, to map the distribution of dark matter in the universe, but it is actually also, if you, if you think about the strong lensing, this is an effect that was already predicted by Einstein and is now used experimentally. It is, uh, it is another way to determine the mass of galaxy clusters because these very massive clusters, they can act as a gravitational lens for objects that are behind them. You know, distant galaxies like quas qu quasars or so. So no, I mean, we, uh, you know, there is dark matter, we think, in galaxies, right? There's, a, you know, this non-baryonic dark matter, as has been mentioned, and there's certainly also um, dark matter outside of galaxies, yes. Catherine Cesarski. Um, yes, I am here. <laughs> yes, yes uh, you were talking about the, the prospects or what we're expecting from experiment. And I was surprised you didn't mention also the Chinese satellite called Dampe. Uh, 
Yes, well, uh, yes, of course. Because I mean, I didn't mention a lot, a lot of things, believe me. No, but, I know, you know, the I red know. was already light, yes. But so there no, are other... Let, let me yes. finish my question, if yes. um, So this is a satellite that was launched in December 2015, yes. which has experiments of the kind of AMS that you exactly. mentioned yes. and of Fermi that you mentioned, only that they improved on both of these. They have, in particular, a much higher uh, spectral resolution. So in case right. they are really thin gamma ray lines, they are really the best place to discover it. They also go to much higher energies. And uh, there is involvement of groups, in particular, a very strong involvement from the group from Geneva. Right. Yes, so yes, I, of course, I, I know my colleagues. That yes. you must know no, no, about of it. course, I know. I mean, and there is a group of Geneva also in exactly. AMS, but there are no real results yet no, from that. No, the reason I'm right? mentioning yeah. it is because yeah. in last month I ran into the head of the Chinese space program. Right. And uh, he told me that they will soon release, that they have very exciting results that they will very soon release. Yes, and and we are looking forward. Whether you heard about it. I mean, to me, at the moment, it's the most promising, you know, the next thing that may happen is this, Dampe. Well, let me make a comment, yes, uh, sure, for this, in a, but you know, we have seen already very, a lot of false positives from indirect detection, because this astrophysical background is extremely hard to model, and actually the AMS collaboration, including the spokesperson, you know, they, if you talk to them, to some of them, they say we have discovered dark matter, while their signal is actually totally compatible with the background, right? So uh, that's why we have to be cautious of, you know, I think all of these experiments are complementary to one another and it would be nice to see, um, to see data from all of them. But yes, I also did not mention another Chinese project for direct detection, which is called Panda X, which also made great progress. And, you know, they're going to, uh, to the next stage and so on, but yeah. Une question de ce côté-ci, Michel Davier. Ah. Yeah, you showed the possible extension of these uh, direct detection detector Darwin. Yes. How does it match? Uh, does it reach the neutrino floor? Or so right. that's the first Yeah, so this is it's designed more or less. Okay, this is I draw it bit by hand because I took this from this Nature article. But yes. But so, where, where is the neutrino floor here? Ah, okay, yes, I didn't say this. So the neutrino floor here is this one. Oh, so what is called the neutrino floor means that we will start to see background events from neutrinos. But to get to this, so these are from atmospheric neutrinos and the diffuse supernova neutrino background, while this here at lower masses and higher cross section, this comes from, uh, from the solar neutrinos, mostly Bohr 8 neutrinos. Okay, so we will definitely see already, not so much with one ton, but with n ton, we will already see coherent neutrino nucleus scattering from solar neutrinos. Uh, however, to see the atmospheric neutrino background, that here implies an exposure of about 400 ton years, so very large exposure. But yes, Darwin is supposed to, um, to cover this, this uh, high mass region, you know, and to do many other uh, physics uh, uh, there, channels. Uh, are there ideas how to beat the, this? Uh, is it really uh, yes. reducible uh, by some, well, you need some topology of, of the event? Or? Well, I mean, uh, the solar neutrino, you can, uh, you could, in principle, overcoming by looking at the direction of the scattering, right? Because we yeah. know where the sun is. Sure. Um, so, uh, however, that conflicts with the requirement that you need very large detectors with ultra-low background because a directional detector is usually a low-pressure gas TPC, right? Okay. Uh, but, oh, I mean, oh, there is a lot of R&D on that and it's a good thing, but uh, I think you, you are motivated to build such a detector once you actually have a discovery. Without a discovery, it's very hard to know. You know, the size of a directional detector at this point is already gigantic based on the cross-sections that were already excluded. Right? Right? While for the atmospheric and diffuse supernova neutrino background, of course, these come from all directions at this point, right? So it's really very hard, uh, you know, atmospheric neutrinos could really fake a 100 GV WIMP, and it, it would be quite, quite difficult to distinguish. On the other hand, on the other hand, this background will start at cross sections around 10 to the minus 49. So of course I didn't show here, but if we would discover something with xenon one ton or with another detector, then the signal that you would then map with much, with much higher statistics with the next generation of detectors would be way above the neutrino background, right? 
But, but uh, I think that if we do not find any evidence for these dark matter particles until we get to here, and if you have no new news from the LHC and in the detection, then it is really very hard to motivate to build detectors that could overcome that. You know, even in principle, that might be possible. So. Est-ce que quelqu'un veut encore intervenir, peut-être parmi nos invités, M. Spiro? Uh, one naive question. Uh, could you comment that, on the possibility that black matter could be made of uh, primordial black holes after the discovery of, uh, of massive yeah. black holes by LIGO, Virgo? Well, uh, I mean, it's not my, not a topic of, you know, not what I am... Um, usually doing, but actually I was asking a colleague who is an expert who recently gave a colloquium at ETH, it's Tom Abel, from, he's the director of, uh, of the Kavli Institute in Stanford, uh, Slack, and I was asking him about this, you know, because he's well known for this, um, you know, first stars, for first galaxies and so on, and I was asking what he thinks about this idea that dark matter could be made of these massive black holes that were formed before Big Bang nuclear synthesis. And he said, there's no way you get those. There's no way even in a simulation. So uh, this is what I know about it, yeah. So it's, it's uh, you know, the, this, these models that are being produced, is, um, sorry, um, th these models that are being um, put forward, they're very much ad hoc. You know, she says it's, it's quite, Impossible, that's what he says, to get this, this black hole, ho sorry, black holes to form at these early times with these masses, right? So, yeah. Because they would still have to be around today, no? So they have to have a certain mass indeed. Yeah. 